Hello. Thank you all for all of those who have joined us uh, for this webinar. This is the second in our series to uh, get customers back in store post COVID. How do we make store shopping great again? Um, I know that there's, there's lots of attendees. We've already got 36 attendees. Uh, we've got an overwhelming response to this uh, webinar. So hopefully you all find it useful. We know there are attendees from all over the world. We know there are people from um, east of Asia to the west of the US. So hopefully it's not too early or too late for, for, for anyone. Uh, thank you all for, for joining. Um, I, uh, my name is Sid Sarangi. I'm the uh, CEO of Reintelligence. Hopefully uh, I'll now introduce my colleague, Chris, um, who, um, uh, just a second, I'll try to. So um, Chris had spoken for us in our previous webinar as well. And there was a lot of positive feedback about his, about uh, people loving uh, what he had to share. So I'm, I'm delighted that Chris has agreed to, uh, to, to, to join this webinar as well. And uh, I know Chris from the days that uh, we worked together at Tesco's um, and he now runs his own space range and display consulting company. And I can honestly say he's probably one of the best in the world in this business. So uh, I'll just um, uh, hand over to Chris to say hi. Hello, um, I hope everybody's well. Uh, I hope the weather's well uh, where you are. Um, it's a little bit windy here. It's a bit cold and it's a bit windy, but uh, dark outside as is the norm past about six o'clock nowadays. But uh, I hope you're all well and uh, looking forward to it. Thanks, Chris. Just so all of you know, um, Chris is right now in Azerbaijan. So just uh, when he says uh, the time, if anyone's wondering, this, this is really a global <laughs> uh, webinar as I am uh, currently in the UK. So um, the, the agenda that uh, we will be covering today, basically the evolution of space range and display as a business function in retail. Now, you would have, you've, you'd, all of you may have heard of some version of space range and display. How did it start? How, how did it start <laughs> to become more important? Best practices in this area, roles and responsibilities of different uh, business functions within retailers so um, I, i'll let uh, chris and i can't think of anyone better to lead you through that and then i'll try to uh, pitch in to say how machine learning can help make that very complex process simpler and and uh, easier to deploy and how machine learning could take all that human intelligence that that human factor that has to go into the current process and make that uh, much more easier to, to run. You will see the process is not simple. Uh, it does require careful deployment. Uh, Chris will go through that, but we will then be able to see how machine learning helps. We'll also be able to see how space swing and display, if deployed properly, moves from being an enabler of the business, of a retail business to a driver. So it moves a retailer away from a push, a product push, supplier driven strategy to a customer pull driven strategy so it's no longer the supplier or the supply chain determining what is it that you're selling but as it should be it's the customer determining that so that's the agenda for today so um i'll start off by handing over to chris to talk about how uh, the, the entire retail business evolved around this so to start from here then thanks sid so it's, it's interesting. So the amount of retailers that I speak to around the world who think that SRD, space range and display, space range and merchandising is this brand new thing and it's this brand new invention and it's, well, we don't really do that here. I think, I think retailers have to accept that, that they all have an element of SRD, of, of space range and display, space range and merchandise, whether or not they choose to put all of that into one function and run it as a separate function and as a distinct function is a slightly different thing. And I think that's probably the new part. But if we think back to retail when it first started, when I was a kid back in the day, um, and, and before that even, um, probably when the dinosaurs were around and stuff. But, you know, I, I grew up in a tiny little village uh, in the middle of Northumberland, uh, which was about 
I think it was about 16 miles away from the nearest town, more than a bike ride anyway at my age. And there was a small store just across from our house. And the guy in there, Ron Lightfoot, ran this store like a military operation. I mean, he knew everybody, knew everybody in the in the uh, whole village. He knew, I guess, uh, people's buying patterns, right? So he knew when people were going to come in and buy stuff. His trips to the cash and carry to go and stock up were simply dictated by his customers. And I think the only the only issue we had was with price, right? Because he didn't have a scale because, the, the, you know, uh, shops in villages and small independent retailers tend to be a little bit more expensive. And that's kind of how things started to evolve. So we started off with independent stores where everybody knew everybody else. And then we gradually started to move into how can we make this into something that makes a little bit more money and that spreads out to more and the successful independents started to do that and started to open up more stores in the next village or the next town and started to scale themselves with basically an innate knowledge of how their customers functioned and a very personal experience of serving people and buying specifically for people and then we developed into something around so so department stores became a bigger thing where you had mainly families who had started up some sort of large store um, who would um, generate enough cash enough income to then go and open in another town or city many of these failed very quickly because of course they didn't understand necessarily if they were a bit of a boutique or a bit of a niche kind of area, they didn't necessarily understand their customers in the new town or the new city they went to. But many of these survived for years and you can think of all the different names like Phoenix and Selfridges and all of those different companies. And many of them involved into, uh, evolved into um, sort of multinational retailers that we would know now, like Tesco, like Sainsbury's, like Morrison's, et cetera, et cetera. But, the difference here is we've got people starting off on that journey of trying to scale things, trying to buy more for less as a retailer so they can sell things either at a better profit or sell things for less to customers. And there's a broadening here with the increase of space there's a broadening of range and a broadening of different things that people many years ago would have seen for the very first time in some of these stores. And then it involves, evolves into something that we would all pretty much now recognize as our current supermarkets or the early stages of our current supermarkets. And I went to work for Safeways when I was 16. And there was still that element of personalization because it was still the only supermarket for many miles around. This is before the days of um, Metro and Express format. So before the days where we had multiple outlets in the same town. Um, and this was still very much, despite the fact that the range was centrally controlled a bit more, there was still very much the ability for the local supermarket to change their space, to change their range slightly to adapt it to customers. And although these were early days of planograms, I remember my very first planogram received when I was in store and I was all very excited to go and implement it for the first time, which is a little bit sad, but um, I saw the list and there was a list on the side called a Jacob's Ladder. And this was, if you can't fit all of the products in, these are the products that you take out and it's in this order. So it was a bit more of a, this is what we'd like you to do as a planogram. If you can't quite do it, this is what we would, this is how we would recommend shaping that and, and varying that for your local needs. And of course, you know, as a, as a 16 year old, I mean, I worked there for, for 10 years, but there were still regular customers coming in at regular times for certain things. I remember I met the bass player from Lindisfarne, which more, most of you won't have any idea what it is, but it's a, it was a very famous group in the Northeast of England. Um, and he used to come in and buy organic eggs certain kind of eggs and i was devastated one day when he came in and they weren't there and he said oh do you have any people running around warehouses looking for things and stuff but the point of it is that at this point we start centralizing things head offices at this point are probably still 
very, very small environments with very few people centrally trying to manage this. And as these, as these retail outlets start to make money, start to become more successful, start to scale, then we start to find ourselves in some of the situations we have now where we have these huge head offices, where you have thousands of people employed, um, stores who phone up to speak to the guy who does planograms and it turns out that it's a department or a team of you know, 120 people. So people start making a lot, of more, a lot more money and to do that, they have to create this massive machine and you start to lose a little bit of that personalization. You still have your teams in store who are regularly interacting with these people, with these customers who come in, who put the control around what they can do for them and how they can do stuff, and the control around, um, I guess, that, that, that immersive experience for a customer and that sort of feeling that they're the top of our priority starts to sort of drift away a little bit and it becomes more of this sort of like faceless corporation, I suppose. Um, but this is where SRD starts. This is where, as we start to scale things, people start to realize that as a retailer, some of your most important things, and I always say, I always say that uh, space is the second biggest asset that a retail company ever has. The first, obviously, being its people and its team, right? And it's the expertise and the knowledge that goes with all of that. But if you're not using your space efficiently, if you're not choosing the right ranges and you're not identifying specific customer types and patterns, it makes things very, very difficult. And it makes things, um, I guess, almost impossible for us to address those individual customer needs or those even groups of customer needs. Great. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Chris. I think uh, just uh, I wanted to let you all know that you'll see on the top of your screens, there's a small video which shows you an old like a department store uh, and, and and evolution of, of the chains. We are not going to play those videos just on, on the webinar. But uh, at the end of the webinar, there'll be a, a survey. If you fill in your email, if you want a copy of the webinar, you'll always be able to sort of look through those videos just in case that gives you a little more context into this visualizes a bit more of what Chris said so um, if we if we are to carry on about uh, asking Chris about uh, best practices so uh, I, he, he's spoken about how uh, how we evolve uh, how we evolve into retail chain how space range and display becomes more and more and more standardized and centralized the question then becomes who's responsible for what how much do the retailers then ask the central offices to do rather than uh, the stores. So um, we'll carry on on that and that's the next section. Up to you again, So, Chris. so SRD becomes a thing, right? It becomes a thing and it's, it can be very slightly different in different retailers around the world, but broadly speaking, um, this, is, this is how most people operate and this is how it evolved in most retailers. And to begin with, I think there was a big recognition that, you know, commercial teams would drive the range, would drive the behavior. To begin with, SRD was very much a function that was there to serve and glue together elements uh, within the head office of, of I guess, um, some of the more historical functions. So you've always had a commercial team, you've always had a property team or something who's going out and buying sites. Um, you've always had an in-store team and suddenly SRD becomes this sort of glue which holds it all together. And I guess the, the standard process would not be dissimilar to this in most retailers where you set your space and you basically work out how much space you would give to a certain, it begins with a store and a format, then it goes down and boils down to a department level, then it boils down to a category level within that. How much space would you give each category in each store, in each refit store, in each new store, in each existing store, if you're going to go through a, a schedule change every year? And then you would create some sort of macro floor plan from that. So some sort of indication that this is the amount of space we have, ideally in every store. You would then build your ranges and agree your ranges to fit that space. Now. The one caveat to that is there are certain situations where you would do that the other way around. 
So certain situations possibly where you have a new store where you might want to work out first what your range should be and how you fit that range to your individual customer profiles and then you would potentially set your space to accommodate that range in the most operationally efficient way possible. Um, so the space and the range tend to be very, very interactive. That then leads us to build a planogram. I'm assuming everybody knows what a planogram is. For those of you who don't, it's basically um, a computer based 3D model of the shelves and the products that you would see in store. And we build these so that we can look at the displays, we can look and see how things will look for our customers, but we can also work out how much capacity of each product we have. So do we have the right space, not just at a category, a department, a store level, but at a product level as well, at that micro level? Do we have enough space of that product for it to be available and on sale to customers at all times? And that's, that's one of the holy grails. And then, we output those planograms and they reach our colleagues in stores and they are implemented. Um, obviously, not always 100% um, how we'd like. Um, generally, you would have a feedback loop in there somewhere where stores either have an opinion of where things are located and how they're located and whether or not we could do a little bit better for their customers or Generally, uh, these are the reasons why I can't possibly implement that and there's a pillar in the way or they don't have enough shelves or the stock hasn't turned up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those form that kind of loop. So once you have that implemented in stores, that then creates that, that, that massive data pool that you need to go and analyze that space and analyze that range. And then in the next iteration of this circle, vary it and make sure that you're maximizing your sales, your profit, and your availability for customers, I guess. So, and this is very much to begin with, you know, SRD was an enabler, and, and what you end up with, you end up with a whole series of business uh, projects and a business strategy, and that then feeds down into the various different functions and generally SRD would be right in the middle of all of that. So regardless of what you're gonna change, if you're a retailer and you're selling stuff to people from standard bricks and mortar outlets, you are gonna to want to change your space at some point. You are going to want to change your range at some point. You are going to want to change the way that your products are displayed to people. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people forget that for some retailers, for some very large retailers that don't have a massive marketing budget and aren't on our TVs all the time telling us where to go and what to buy and things, for a lot of retailers, the main interactive part that we have, the main interactivity that we have with our customers is through our range and our displays. So that is, is the, I guess, the essence of the brand in store is what you see in front of you. And that's driven yep. by, you know, display principles and, and the space principles, the amount of space that we give to things and how we locate those, where, where we locate those around that store and how we make that customer journey as appealing and as efficient as possible. And, and you get differences in different stores and different locations because they've got a car park or they haven't got a park, car park, if they haven't got a car park, people aren't going to necessarily do as big shops as they might normally do. So you have to think about pack size and you have to think about size of the products, convenience. Completely different animal as we know. Um, and then some of it's about location and it's about the type of people that, that visit that store. Is there a high ethnicity in that area? Do we have people with more money in that area? And all of those things you have to sit and try and work out and have to sit and crunch data and crunch numbers and try and second guess the market. One of the biggest things, of course, is how you forecast what's going to happen in the year ahead. And some of the stuff that's happened in the last two years, I don't think anybody would have forecast, apart from in some sort of science fiction novel. But um, but here we are. Here we are. I'm still alive, inshallah. So you end up with, with 
But all of these different things coming and being decided from insight groups, coming from the board, coming from different commercial strategies and different ideas that people have, it's all delivered right through SRD that sits right in the middle of everything and then goes out to our retail colleagues, or our refit teams, our new store teams, to try and implement that vision for customers as quickly and painlessly as possible with as least disruption as you can, as you can get, really. And I think uh, to support what you just said, Chris, that uh, the space range and display is your first, sort of even your first degree of separation from your customer, that's what the customer says. And if you actually, uh, I think, if you think about people posting on LinkedIn, when, when they post about, oh, we opened this new store, or we are now open for business here, they actually always post pictures of you know, display, right? They don't, they, they don't post pictures of, of the tills, for example, or the back office. They, they post pictures of how the, yeah, how, yeah, how yeah. the stuff is laid out. These this, wonderful that's shelves what the that we've got here, aren't they amazing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and um, you're absolutely right. It, th this is, this is and, and I, I had this discussion um, probably a year or 18 months ago in Saudi Arabia, tends to be a bit of a, I guess, uh, there's a bit of hesitancy in a lot of a lot of emerging markets or countries that, that don't traditionally do this sort of thing. People tend to allow suppliers to go and do this type of thing for them. And as a result, a lot of retailers actually end up looking pretty much the same. So there's a slight variation in range. There's, there's generally a slight variation in price here and there. There might be a slight variation in the location it is within the store. But, and I had this when I was in Saudi Arabia, looking at two different competitors and being like almost laughing about their um, canned meat and fish displays. And I was going, we thought we were bad. Oh my God, they've had a nightmare. And then I walked into one of our stores and it was exactly the same. And you go, oh my God. And it's because it's because the supplier has worked out what he thinks he wants to do as a planogram, and he just goes and refits that all out to all of the retails that he supplies. And the SRD, if you get it right in an environment like that, is a massive differentiator. It's a massive differentiator. Imagine being a customer and walking into some of those supermarkets where you sort of go, I can't find anything. It's not logically where I'd expect to see it when I get there. It's very confusing. Everything looks the same. It's jumbled up. If you can get that right and you can make it super easy for people to find things and super easy for people to locate those ranges within that store, and it's a logical shopping mission when they're pushing the trolley or carrying the basket around, it's a massive differentiator. It makes a massive difference for people. Really, really, really does. Okay. And, uh, and again, just to sort of reiterate the point of SRD being right in the middle of everything, um, it's, it's, you know, I, I guess in my experience through the years, it's, it tends to be when you're in SRD, you're always getting a lot of volume from one direction or another. And it tends to be either traditionally supply chain, stores, commercial, marketing generally they, these are all people who have opinions on what we should do and how we how we should do it um all of which historically were based a lot on opinion rather than actual fact so you end up chasing lots and lots of different rabbit holes and, and running around trying to do things and, and and more or less disproving stuff as much as you possibly can in order to stick to the path and stick to those principles and stick to um, what you've agreed as a strategy for SRD, because people will always have an opinion on how we do things and why we do things. And this was, I mean, I, I used to have some, some regular um, discussions with our commercial teams in, in Tesco and internationally as well, and you'd say, Guys, you all have a massive opinion on how I build planograms and how much space I give to things. But, you know, I, I don't come to you and say, well, you know, this should be in the master assortment and this should be that cost price and it should be this. And unfortunately, it's such an emotive subject because it is exactly what we just described. It is, it is, the, it is the way that we, 
we show ourselves as a business to customers, it defines our brand, it defines how we look, and it's the way people shop and the way people interact. And it's it's just that simple. So there is always an awful lot of people asking for things or people trying to influence things, and it can be um, it can be quite a lonely place to be at times. You know, you don't get a lot of Christmas cards in SRD, that's for sure. Is that just you, Chris, or is that everyone in yeah. SRD? <laughs> so, so, well, it's, it's probably just me, to be honest. It's probably just me. So why do we need it? And look, we've, we've talked about this quite a lot. So um, in terms of good for customers, better customer service, manageable change, but also listening to customers and giving them what they want and what they need. And the idea of laying things out on a, on, a, on a shelf according to a customer decision tree, according to a scientific or an analytical way of us saying, this is how people shop, this is how people want to buy this and, and what they want to see, is always going to have a huge impact on um, customer satisfaction and ultimately on, on volume and value sales, right? I mean, it has to. Um, good for stores and a lot of people miss this out a lot of people miss this out so better availability is good for stores but that improved operational efficiency is absolutely key and this was something that many of us probably learned for the first time at tesco i mean i used to work for and i i i won't tell you who it was but it's on my linkedin profile and stuff though but i worked for a few diy retailers before i worked for tesco and you know, there wasn't really a lot of consideration about how much capacity of product you put on the shelf. When I came to Tesco, I sort of went, well, this is really good, actually. This is, this is what we've been looking for. This is, this is kind of the holy grail. And when you think about retail in the UK in the 1990s and for a long time, Sainsbury's were the absolute kings of this, their availability had a massive slip in the 90s. And this is where Tesco absolutely smoked them this is where tesco suddenly went we'll create this thing called level rundown many of us know it as target shelf capacity there's different names written different businesses but the idea that each product has to have a specific capacity in order for it to be on sale for customers at all times including those peak shopping trips um and the reason why this is so important for stores is because you don't have to constantly go back and forwards to the warehouse to fill this product up. And you don't have to hold massive amounts of stock in the warehouse. And that obviously frees up things like working capital for many businesses. Many, many retailers across the Middle East, um, this is a huge problem. Because suppliers are effectively ranging stores and giving retailers what they want to sell, regardless of what customers want to buy you end up with this almost coronary heart attack for a, a retailer where you've got thousands of weeks of cover of products on shelves and the products that you are selling don't have enough space. So you end up with walking into back rooms and you, you can see this right the way across Saudi and, and areas like that. You walk into back rooms and the places are washed with stock. And it's the first market where I've known that they employed people to go around and check code life on FMCG. So we're checking the code life on canned products and things like that. And you go, my God, this is like, you go, well, we've had to remove 16 of those. And you go, but it's a can of tuna. And they go, yeah, it's out of date. And you go, a can of tuna is out of date. How much stock cover have we got on the shelf? And this is, this is critically important. That efficient supply chain, that operation efficiency within store as well is absolutely crucial when we think about um, changes in behavior and, and referring to the you know the first couple of slides again where you know we used to have we used to have very different um, staffing models within stores so people used to be on full-time contracts people used to work for retailers for many many years you know it, it wasn't unusual that one of the ladies on the checkouts would have been there for 30 or 40 years. Um, but now things are very different. Now we have to save money. We have to save money in stores. So we have people who are on part-time contracts quite a lot. We have mixtures of different people who are on contracts which suit what they're doing within their 
social lives or you know having to go and pick up children from school or running their own business from home etc 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 so a lot of these things have changed so it means that the supply chain and what we should what we put on the shelf and how we do all of that within the store has got to be absolutely efficient otherwise you end up with the same problems that we've always had where you have too much stock in the back room you have out of stocks everywhere um, and you don't have a good efficient use of everybody's time and space and obviously like i said it's great for retailers you've got generally increased sales reduced waste less stock holding um, and it's a point of differentiation another thing just to sort of um just to just to touch on it's not all about it's not all about volume and value as well a lot of people make this mistake it's also about profit and it's about working out that right profit measure for you so profit is not just margin it's not it's not just the difference between cost and retail price Profit is how much you spend within that supply chain, how much you spend within that store. There are fixed costs, there are variable costs. If we, for example, in Tesco or most other retailers I've ever worked in, if you, if you managed your space in produce according to volume and value sales, we would probably give a massive percentage of the produce space to bananas but no retailer I've ever worked in makes any money from bananas. So you would end up losing a whole lot of money. So you have to think very carefully about things. It's not just about volume. You have to think about profit as well, but proper dimensional profit. Is it, is it fair to say, Chris, I mean, all this obviously sounds simple, but you know, is it fair to say that, at least in my experience, I've seen that some retailers don't even have the, no, the space that they have in each store. So if you were to ask head office how much space or how much linear meat, is that is that a fair statement, Chris? I mean, uh, in some of the less... Yeah, I, I, think, I think it is. I think it is. I, I was interviewed, um, oh, I don't know, probably about, probably about eight years ago for one of, one of the biggest food retailers uh, in, in the UK. And at the time when I spoke to them, they had no idea uh, which stores had which ranges and how much space they had. And I was, I mean, I was visibly taken aback. And they said, you know, our, our buying team have been around for a long, long time and they, they're a bit old school and, you know, we just allocate stuff out and you sort of go, oh my gosh. But more and more, though, when I see this around the world, when I speak to different retailers in the UK, particularly out in, in some of the emerging markets that we've got around the world, and more and more, um, there is this kind of, I don't know, just a, just a, it, everybody thinks it's, it's a bit of a sort of dark art, that the whole thing's like very mysterious. And, and you sort of go, you know, if you don't know how much space you've got for each individual range within a store, and you then achieve? you're, you know, well, well, looking at different sales, and looking at different volumes for different products doesn't really mean that much at all. Because if you don't understand the density you have in that store, it may be that in that store, you've got twice the amount of space as the other store. So it's, you have to factor in all of this and it's critically important, critically important. Yeah, and I think it's it's obvious that the, the process is complex. It has to balance various business functions. It, you have to you have to manage the different pressures from different ends. There is this uh, there's this illustration that you might be able to all of you might be able to see on the screen. Uh, goes through the detailed SRD process. Uh, if you want a more detailed session, there's a couple of emails that you can at the top who you can email, uh, and someone will get in touch with you uh, and and see see how we can organize that. Uh, I can see there's a few questions uh, coming in. Uh, I will wait. There's a point where we will take even more questions and we'll answer the questions that come on. Uh, but I'll carry on for the moment because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, I'll, I'd like Chris to speak about how now uh, we are, although we are now growing, uh, the, the, the retail chains are growing, uh, efficiencies are, are having to be realized by standardizing and yet the customer wants a customer still now wants more and more localized so the customer is back at the center so uh 
uh, uh, it's like almost the old days of the village shop where you expect that as you go in, you'll get exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. So uh, Chris, is that your view as well? Hello, Chris, I can't hear you. Hello. Okay, sorry guys, I don't know if I'm, uh, if, if Chris- Hello, can... so, uh, yeah. um, sorry. you're absolutely right. Go on, go on, Chris, sorry, I think there was okay, just- I think there's a bit of a lag. I'm, I'm, I'm many, many hours away from the UK at the moment. So, um, and, and this is kind of the point of today, right? It is, is we, we've gone from where everybody knew your name, uh, sounds like a popular American sitcom from the, from the 90s, but you, we've gone from where everybody knew your name and everybody understood your needs to this sort of faceless corporation type thing where, um, you know, the, the, the retailers had to scale, had to um, be more generic in their approach with things, to being back in a situation where it's more important than ever to put the customer right at the heart of what you do because there's so much competition that if you don't put that customer on a pedestal and you don't try and cater your range and your shopping trip for individual customer types and customer needs, you will end up um, basically not, not making half as much money as you could have, have, have made, but also losing customers. And I mean, how many times have you walked into a store, gone to find something that you really want, it's a critical thing. So I don't know, you're making a you're making a chili or something like that. You go into a store and there's no kidney beans and you go and you know that you can get them at a retailer next door. So you just put your basket down and you go, that's it. I'll go because you know, maybe, maybe you're walking home, you don't have a car, so you're gonna have bags to carry. You don't want to carry bags from that shop, go into that shop, just buy two things. It's it's just a hassle. And we live in a world now where everything's about convenience. Everything's about people want it and they want it right now. They want their ranges to be available. They want them to be at the right price. They want, um, they want to be able to go anywhere they want and at any time almost. It sounds a bit strange, but um, if, if I think back to, you know, when I was a kid, if we wanted to order stuff to be delivered to the house, there wasn't an internet and stuff. Um, you know, we had to do mail order. And these mail order, they all, it, everything was for delivery in 28 days. And everybody just accepted that. Well, if if that hadn't changed, I mean, it's it's incredible to think now. You know, you go on Amazon, and if you want to order something, and it's probably something that's completely non-essential, right? It's a book or it's a CD, or I'm sure major CDs. Or it's a computer game, or it's something that you want. Um, and if it's not available in like 48 hours, you go, ah, oh, that's ridiculous, ridiculous. I've got to have that. It's got to be here tomorrow. There's this massive consumer pull for stuff. Um, and if we don't recognize that and we don't try and tailor retailers uh, to that customer, it's a real, real struggle. It's a real, real struggle. So, um... Thanks, thanks, Chris. We'll we'll uh, we'll uh, carry on on how uh, how machine learning can enable this seamlessly. Uh, we will continue to have questions for Chris. So uh, if you have some, please send them across. I'll just read out a couple of questions for you, Chris, while we wait. So there's a question from Deepak Narsinghani. Uh, he's asking, is it beneficial to change SRD as per events slash festivals? Uh, so, Chris, do you have so, a view? I, I, so, when, when, I, when I guess you say, um, to, to, so effectively you're saying to change planograms, to change space, et cetera, and it, it absolutely is. And if I, if I think back to my, my life in retail in the UK, uh, we would have a, um, a range change calendar for each year. And a lot of things that went on that range change calendar were negotiable, but the things that weren't negotiable, or the major festivals, or the major seasonally driven launches. So things like varying your produce range and space between spring, summer, and autumn winter is absolutely crucial. 
absolutely crucial. Um, ensuring that you free up space uh, for seasonal events like, you know, uh, if I'm thinking from the Christian calendar, like, you know, uh, Easter and Christmas or from, from further afield, like, you know, Diwali or Ramadan. This is absolutely essential that stores prepare for these things and that they vary their ranges and the presentation of those to suit that particular occasion. Otherwise, you're missing a huge opportunity. Okay, I'm just, um, uh, please keep sending your questions across and as yes, conscious of time, we do have to, we do have to carry, uh, so cover the machine learning aspects of space range and display. So basically, uh, we did speak about the complicated space range and display process, how, how we have to be precise, how we have to get the data right, how we have to now, even with scale, now the new demands of the customers are even with scale, have uh, be it grocery be it hard lines be it fashion uh, we need to have a very customer focused uh, approach so how can machine learning help that so i've tried to cover the processes that chris spoke about how can how can machine learning supercharge each individual process so we did speak about potentially uh, first setting the space uh, if you want to set the space to just determine how much space by category that you have to share uh, machine learning can help because machine learning can help you set a goal uh, to maximize. So uh, I, I, many of you would know how uh, machine learning algorithms work. Uh, you will maximize a goal. Do you want to maximize uh, for a particular category, the sales, the units, the margin? As, as Chris said, there are multiple ways to view profit. Some In some categories, you might want to maximize foot, footfall in store. So units are more important. In some cases, it's purely a margin game. So you have to set the goal, and then you have to sort of assimilate the best performance from across each other's stores to assimilate that across your business. So you will align that with customer shopping behavior and demographics, and that will determine what's your optimal space in each store for each category. So uh, 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 it's sort of almost if you have a proper set of tools. Uh, I'd like to think that our products are among the best in that, but you could uh, you could feed uh, your sales data and you it would tell you how a good machine learning algorithm would tell you how best you can align with your shopping behavior, the shopping missions in your store. The example that Chris mentioned that you have gone to do, if you wanted to create a chili and there's no kidney beans, that should not happen for an example. So you set the space accordingly and then the next it's agree range. So the range you'll have to be standardized and yet customized obviously seemingly paradoxical so how do you standardize and yet have the range customized to individual customers you will have to troll through individual customer shopping patterns at each store and the shopping missions why do my customers come to this store versus that and then i have to create store clusters using machine learning i have to create uh, we'll get to that in a moment. We we'll create store clusters using machine learning and then create assortments for each cluster and then cut it by the space determined uh, by, uh, by a previous uh, step that we just had to assign space. So uh, a, a lot of this uh, was being done through crunching spreadsheets, trying to cut across different dimensions, but it would never be efficient. You would always be you could make mistakes, you would always miss data, you would always be, uh, you would have your own human bias. So this actually cuts across all dimensions to create the right range for each store uh, using machine learning. Uh, this is just an example that I have, I've tried to show here. Uh, in, 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 the old, in the old days, you would create uh, store clusters using small, medium, large as a, as a uh, as a potential Russian doll kind of store clusters, or you would use demographics as the main main uh, as the main parameter. But th those were those were effectively you choosing one of the parameters, one of the many possible parameters that can be used with machine learning. Uh, and and I know the, the the figure on the right looks a bit scary, but with machine learning, you can easily crunch it into different store clusters. Uh, and it'll tell you exactly what are the different store clusters and why. 
why are they different and how should you what product should go in each one so uh, this is just an example of how machine learning can supercharge the process uh, and make it easier make it uh, sort of remove some manual processes from uh, manual elements of the process and, and increase um, uh, machine learning in there um, third step we spoke about and I'll, I'll let chris speak about a good example on this uh, build planograms so uh, there are building a planogram is is obviously important but then unless you know what the customer shopping missions are what the customer edition tree is what the actual product hierarchy product display hierarchy is uh, you will you will not build the planograms in the right order you might build a uh, Planograms that maybe look good, but they they don't support the shopping mission. Uh, if if the tool that is being used to build the planogram does not use uh, machine learning capabilities, uh, so just an example here. Um, Chris, would you like to speak about this? Chris was speaking about how supplier focused sometimes some some products are, and this is an example that uh, maybe maybe. Yeah. So so I I was I was back in the UK. Um, at some point uh, last year, I think it was, and uh, had, a, had a bit of a lawn issue uh, at the back of the house. Desperately needed to go out. My previous trimmer, um, uh, the battery had kind of blown up or something like that. It wasn't working. And uh, I went out to buy a trimmer. And I went into a, a very popular um, DIY retailer in the UK, walked down the power tool aisle, uh, and just sort of went, and you know this 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 is the type of example where this is actually super efficient and super easy for the retailer and basically you end up with all of your um gardening power tools are merchandised by brand and it looks great you've got these big big orange sort of blocks for flymo and you've got, you know, Bosch or all these big sort of um, green blocks and stuff. But for a customer, it's it's almost impossible to navigate because you go, I don't want to buy a Flymo or a Bosch. I, it's not some sort of competition to go out and buy one of every power tool that Bosch uh, range. I want to go out and buy a strimmer. And if I want to go and buy a strimmer, I want to go and pick up all of the different brands and the different types. And I want to compare price. And I will compare how heavy it is because I get a bit of a bad back nowadays. And I want to I want to look at the different features. So cordless versus corded. What type of those horrible little plastic tags does it use when they spin around? All of those different things. You need to compare those things. And I remember working for a DIY retailer many moons ago, and they had a similar suggestion with the normal DIY power tools where we were going to put all of Black & Decker together all of JCB together and the, the buyer said it's great because if we fall out with one of them we just take that mod out and we put a mod of something else in like JCB or Bosch Blue or something and you're yeah but I don't go into a store and say I want to buy a Black & Decker I want to buy a drill or I want to buy a sander or I want to buy it's all about that customer decision tree how people choose what they want and having that range of options right in front of them so they can pick up and compare and that's how you trade people up that's how you get people to spend that little bit more maybe the one that's that's finest or is a much much better brand maybe it's on promotion this week and you go it's only an extra 20 quid maybe i can maybe i can maybe i can be that bosch blue owner that i've always wanted to be or whatever it is right it's it's but that's how you've got to do it. You can't do it this way because people walk in and go, I just want to buy a bloody lawnmower. And yep. they're all over the place. And I haven't got a color coordinated garden really. So, you know, I want to do I want to fly more, a push one or a cordless one or a flipping one that rakes the grass behind me. Or I don't know. But you want to be able to compare them. Great. So and and so yeah, you can see that if you had a, a proper machine learning driven customer edition tree, you would not put your products together uh, the way we just saw. Um, then talk about the last step we spoke about, implement in stores. Um, the, the traditional process is you audit for the accuracy of implementation. Again, an audit is a manual process. 
However, you could take it a, a level further. You could have a monitor and alert uh, system which trolls through the data and actually tends to highlight tends to highlight anything that it can sense is wrong. Um, so it can tell you that this particular product or this particular category is underperforming in your store compared to others. Something you may not even know unless it's told to you. You may not know that you might be happy that you're selling uh, enough um, organic eggs, but maybe maybe ideally you should be selling 20% more. Uh, and you, you don't even realize that unless you have some clever algorithm telling you that. So uh, at every stage, the simple process, uh, so the, the traditional processes, which do require a lot of effort, can become simpler, quicker, and more powerful uh, using uh, machine learning. Uh, what does it actually say in summary? We saw, saw about the whole evolution of sort of things going back to the future, right? We, we started from uh, a small store. Uh, people know exactly who comes to shop when. They know Mrs. Jones likes a cut of meat this way, so she comes in on a Friday and I'll have it ready. Uh, two, you move to department stores where you still take care of your customers, but maybe not that much because now, now you're bigger. Till you come to the store chain where you've standardized everything, scale, consistency to drive down price. And now you suddenly face the challenge of online, you face the challenge of COVID, you know that uh, I will now have to have standardization and yet, I will have to tailor the offer for local customers so that everybody gets what they want. Uh, in summary, what we were trying to say throughout this presentation is that machine learning has driven space range and display. It is, it has, uh, it's philosophically, it, it, it has changed from being a supply push to a customer pull. We just saw an example of a planogram of, of sorry, of display where the, it's left to the supplier. Probably the store manager finds it easy. Just leave it to the supplier to fill the shelves. But then that sort of is totally against what the customers come in to buy. Uh, so that's what we would like to say, say as, as, as a summary to this uh, and how, although this process is exceptionally critical and complex, machine learning can enable this to be quicker at every stage. Uh, if you, uh, we will share, uh, we'll, we'll ask you a few questions, uh, we'll answer a few of your questions. We'll share this link if you could, if you could fill this in uh if you could fill in a survey and just please enter your uh, information i'm uh, sharing it in the chat window you should be able to see this you would be able to fill in a survey uh and then you'll also be able to fill in your email to receive a copy of the webinar if you wish uh and in the meantime i'll then go back to some of the questions that have been asked for chris um I, i'll pick uh i'll pick a couple that uh, I mean, obviously, there's many questions. We'll try to answer each one of them individually through an email. Uh, there's a question from uh, Yogesh Deo uh, about how much relevance do clusters have once we have started creating store-specific range and planograms? Uh, this is a very interesting topic. Um, uh, Chris, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to say that what we have found, what we have generally found while deploying our solutions at clients is Store specific, specific is all very well, but if you are able to have your clusters based on customer behavior and not based on old fashioned, small, medium, large, if your clusters have a mix of smaller, medium and large, and if the space is allocated properly, uh, if, your scale, if the space is different in different stores, even within the same cluster, then you will you will automatically have a customized range in each store uh, if, you, if you've done all the steps properly. Uh, you don't necessarily have to build uh, an assortment for every store as long as you've cut it by cluster and space break. Uh, that's, uh, that's the question uh, that had. There's a question from um, Yogesh Pitko, whom I actually happen to know how Yogesh. Um, uh, Yogesh asks, uh, and I think Chris knows Yogesh as well, with AI ML giving ability to tune space range and display more frequently, how do we balance that with the ability to implement the changes in stores so that the customers don't get confused with frequent changes? So uh, Chris, do you have a view? I think Yogesh is saying now obviously the tools will let you constantly update the range. How do you yeah. balance that <clears throat> with, uh, with practicality and sort of not confuse the customer? I think I think it, it it's almost 
it's almost like a self-generating business case, right? Because if you're going to change things regularly, um, there's a chance that you are going to disrupt stuff too much. And not just for stores either, but, but for supply chain, uh, for colleagues in store, you may end up in the unfortunate situation where you have a massive amount of discontinued stock in the business because you've been changing things so frequently that that discontinued stock hasn't had an opportunity to sell through properly. And I see this quite a lot in retailers where availability of new products and products that they want to sell is very low, but availability of products that they want to clear through the supply chain and get rid of is very high. And you end up again with that sort of coronary heart attack situation where you, you are swamped with stock that you don't want anymore, but you can't get rid of it. So I think, I think there's a few different things. I think, I think changing things frequently can be good, but you have to measure that disruption against the benefit of doing it. Everything should come with a forecast. Everything should come with a prediction. Um, and again, you know, referencing the, the, the other previous question about clusters versus um, store specific ranges, it's a similar thing, right? You have to look at the benefit of those store specific ranges because the downside of it, of it is centrally, it's very difficult to manage. And you can let, it, you can let a little system go off and do things and, and ping a product here and ping a product there and do all of that sort of thing. But when it comes around to buyers sitting down with suppliers and negotiating how many products a store is in or curating that range and, and trying to um, go and, and reassess the master assortment, it's very, very difficult when you've got completely different assortments or um, marginally different assortments across the entire, uh, in the entire company. It, it's very, very difficult to sit and go, okay, this product's in 10 stores, that product's in 15, but it's a different 15 to that. And, and it, it becomes very difficult to manage and negotiate. So I think, I think in summary, it's you have to measure what you think the benefit is, of that is going to be versus the disruption to customers and the complexity to manage that in the center. Yep, we are we are running out of time. I still I'll still pick up a couple of more questions. There's a question from Sarian Gorman Davies. Uh, how do you model future trends and not fall into a self-fulfilling prophecy of analyzing historical data all the time? Uh, this is a very good question. I mean, um, historical uh, hindsight bias, as we call it in machine learning. How do we get over that? Uh, I, I'd love to share a session with yourself at some point. Uh, you can, so uh, you have algorithms that filter out hand, hindsight bias. You can also, uh, and this comes into the question of why you use clusters and why not store specific. When you have clusters, you are able to learn from best practices of your similar stores. So for example, if you don't use clusters, you would never know that this particular store could also sell this product. It has never sold there in the past, uh, but, but the data says, it would sell well if, if we did give that product a chance in that store. Now, um, we've actually demonstrated this in our clients in a couple of places where we actually predict uh, products that are missing. So th this store is missing these products. Why are you not selling these products in these? These, these products are undersold in these stores. You're not selling enough. Uh, how do we know it? We know it from uh, similarities across stores, similarities across products. Uh, we also get feeds of uh, com competitor data so we can compare uh, newer products uh, and, and, and sort of not having a historical uh, view. Uh, I think this, could, this may also answer the question of Bob Ferraro, uh, which says, with all the cloud technology so cheap, why would someone consider clustering versus just build store specific to start? So uh, it's probably not any cheaper to do any or the other. We, we could do store specific, but then you're losing out the best practices diffusion across uh, across the chain. So you're not letting the one store learn from the other. Uh, again, it's it's it will have to face a balance. So uh, you, you, if you have tools that are clever enough, they'll be able to predict what is the right balance between clusters and going store specific and it will recommend the right numbers of clusters. Um, I mean, we've got many more questions. We'll find a way to find uh, answers back to yourselves. 
Um, I'm sorry, but we are running out of time, so we can't answer all of them uh, just here yet. Uh, please um, mention it on the on, on the survey if you uh, if you would like to have a chat at some point. But uh, we'll try to get back to you with answers from uh, for all the questions. So. Uh, We've run out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for sharing your views. Uh, it's really Thanks, good man. to have you today. Uh, we will have, we'll continue the series. Uh, we will have uh, John Burry, who is the Chief Commercial Officer of Tesco, in our next webinar, uh, which, uh, which hopefully we should have sometime in the early, early February next year. So thank you all for joining. Uh, and please uh, fill in the survey or get in touch through uh, our website if you want any more information. Thanks again. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, guys. Thank you.